Paul's epistle to the church at Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians, his second epistle. Chapter 2, we'll begin reading at verse 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll begin reading at verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. This is King James Version. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now your, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Thank you, ushers, Amen. for your reverence. I just ask him for your reverence to God's word. Father, we are grateful today to be in your presence, the presence of one another, and we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would deliver to us the understanding that we need so that we can be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we ask this. Amen. Amen. We say Happy New Year to all of you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to be in God's presence on this first Sunday of 2018. Amen. We made it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. For some of us, uh, I think you may have wondered if 2018 would be a year that saw you on this side. And it is. So that means God's not finished with us. Amen. We are saved to serve. And so I thank God that he so honors me, honors us to be able to serve him. I also forgot to mention last week, I want to thank the teams uh, that went out with us on Christmas Eve morning uh, or afternoon into our community to bless our neighbors. Uh, I believe we had a team of 14 do that. So we thank God for that. Amen. As we enter into the New Year, I want to, uh, on the first three Sundays, if the Lord tarries, he's coming in our lives. I want to talk to us about our strength for the journey, our strength for the journey, our strength for the journey. And over these next three uh, Sundays, again, Lord willing, we will talk about uh, the strength that we get from salvation. Uh, we'll talk about the strength that we get from obedience to God's word. And then on the third Sunday, we'll talk about the strength we get from prayer. Uh, we are strengthened by our salvation. We are strengthened by obedience to God's word, to his will. And we are strengthened through a life of prayer. Uh, here, Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica as we talk about strength through salvation. Part one. Uh, here, Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica for the second time. And he's writing to a church that is young in faith. Um, they're not only young in faith, but they are undergoing tremendous amount of oppression, persecution, stress because of that faith, by the way. And he's writing to a church that's unwavering. Uh, a church that's filled with love for one another. They, they've got issues. They've got interpersonal issues with one another, that is. They're having some clashes and conflicts, as people do. Um, but what marks them is their unwavering faith in Christ, the gospel itself, which we'll talk about. Uh, so as we start the year, we ask ourselves, what kind of church do we want to be? Certainly, we want to be that kind of church that's marked in our love, not just for God, who we cannot see, but we're marked... Uh, as a distinctive church because of our love for one another. Amen. Amen. Hereby will they know that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. 
And so that's what should mark us, should make us distinctive. By the way, not just a distinction in the world overall, but a distinction in the church world that we are found loving one another. Although that doesn't necessarily come without conflict, interpersonal stuff. But at the end of the day, we love one another. That's what we should aspire to. In fact, when uh, the writer tells us that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves, right? right? The reason given is so that we can provoke one another to love, right? So love seems to be the fuel and the purpose of our existence in God, right? To love him, to love one another. In fact, all of what the prophets have said can be wrapped up in those things, right? So... Thessalonica is marked by their love. And in fact, the persecution is a little bit more intense because of the fame that they've acquired in their young time in the faith. They become famous even among the other churches, which can cause a little envy and a little jealousy. Right. And certainly at large among the religious people that includes the Jews who did not accept Jesus Christ as Messiah. They are they are also. uh, Kind of gristling or upset by the fact that this new church is drawing away from their ranks. Although Thessalonica is distinctive in scripture because of how many Gentiles made up that church, that is non-Jews. But there are also Jews in the church. And the extent that there were Jews in the church, that meant they were drawing away from their local synagogues. So there was a competition for congregation. I mean, even though there's a competition even today for congregations. It, there is. Maybe I might be educating you on something you don't understand, but a lot of church strategies is not to win lost souls, but to win other folks' members. <laughs> Amen. It's the truth. Because sometimes it's easier to get people to switch their churches than it is to get people to choose Jesus Christ. And I've never been one for that. I, I think the way you grow a church is that you win lost souls. Because anything else is incest. Don't get me going with that. All right. So we should not be poaching other people's folks. We should be winning lost souls. Thessalonica was doing that. And it was making religious people upset. So they were getting persecuted, lambasted. Add on to that the fact that Paul and Silas and Timothy eventually had to leave there abruptly, Paul first. Because even as he was preaching and settling this new congregation, the word got out, the great revival that was happening, and um, he knew he was in peril of his life, and so he had to sneak out of town. And he left before he felt ready to leave. He had been concerned. He sent Timothy back to find out how the church was doing. This was before uh, First Thessalonians was written. And Timothy sends back this glowing report about the love that's there and how they've grown in faith and they're stronger, not weaker. And even though Paul didn't get to do everything he wanted to do, the church was still growing anyway. How many of you know that it's God who grows the church? Right. Paul teaches us this in the Bible. He says some of us sow. Right. Some of us reap. But it's God who increases. Which brings me to a second point on the church model. Not not only are we ought to be a church of love where we are seeking to see souls one to the kingdom, but we have to also respect the power of God to grow us. It's God who grows us. If we are going to grow organically and authentically the way God wants us to grow, we have to acknowledge that it's his power. It's the power. If I'm hungry for anything, I'm, I'm hungry for the power of God to be demonstrated among us. That is you and I. When I call you out to Bible study this coming Saturday and we talk about what ministry truly is, it's really to communicate to you the idea of what what it is that each and every one of us are to God in ministry. You know, I've been talking a lot about purpose in these last few weeks. We left 2017 talking about purpose and we'll enter 2018 talking about the same thing because every soul represented in this hall today has a purpose and that purpose is tied to ministry and that ministry is an expression of the gospel in some way. We don't all express that uh, the gospel message in the same way, but all of us are responsible. It's 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 the purpose of every man, woman, boy and girl 
to express the good news of Jesus, who, who he is and what he's done. And, and our struggle is just to figure out how are we each to express that? Preaching, teaching, singing, doing, whatever it is, all of us express that. Great thing about the church at Thessalonica is even though Paul was absent, they didn't stop growing in faith and they were finding their ways to express the gospel to others. And the church was growing even in Paul's absence because my mama's sitting right here and she'll tell you she used to tell us one monkey don't stop no show. I still don't know exactly what that means, but I, I get the gist of it. Amen. That's right. You just carry on. Right. And so they didn't use the loss of their leader abruptly as an excuse. They found a way to keep moving because they were propelled. They were compelled. They were moved by the power of God himself. And if God before you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. I'm so happy about that today because it's true of my personal life and I believe it's true of yours. So this young, oppressed, but unwavering congregation became a symbol. They became uh, a standard regarding what the church is and what it means to be the church, the body of Christ. And so he's writing to them in the second letter specifically because having written the first letter, uh, the church was able to still to communicate with him some concerns they had about uh, the return of Jesus Christ and what that meant and how exactly it would happen and who would be caught up and who would not be caught up. And there were false teachers emerging and people were trying to speak against Paul and say that um, he had hoodwinked them and he was only wanting their money and so forth and so on. You know how it is in church with rumors and people talking. Maybe you don't know, but it happens. Amen. So Paul had to write to them and, and kind of encourage their heart. So in this first part of talking about our strength for the journey and helping us understand what what it is that allows uh, a church like Thessalonica to prosper and grow. Even when they've abruptly lost their leader, even when um, they're being persecuted spoken out against, even when they're having to contend with trying to determine who who is authentically in the faith, who is authentically teaching Jesus Christ and who has another agenda. What allows us to grow in that kind of environment that is hostile to truth, that is hostile to God, that is hostile to Christ? How do you grow in that environment? Because we're in that environment now. This environment that we're in, this national environment, this global environment is hostile to God. And if you allow me to speak just a little broken English right now, ain't nobody trying to hear about your Jesus right now. There is no space in the public dialogue for talking about Jesus. We want to talk about politics. We want to talk about the environment. We want to talk about gender issues. We want to talk about sexuality. But as soon as you talk about Jesus, you messing up the conversation. When folks are looking for solutions to everything that that hurts us today, we're willing to talk about medicine. We're willing to talk about therapy. We're willing to talk about policies. But as soon as you talk about Jesus, you might as well be talking out the side of your neck. So what allows the church to grow in an environment that is hostile to the church? This is not your grandmother's church, or for some of you, this is not your mother's church, right? This is not the church where folks, no matter what they did on Saturday night, will find a way to slide in the church on Sunday morning. This is not that church. This is, this is not that age. This is not that age that when you miss church, folks will call you and say, man, where were you today? Girl, where were you today? This is not, it's, it's, it's expected that, you know, you're going to take a vacation once or two weeks out of the month. This is not that environment that prioritizes service to God. That prioritizes really talking about being a Christian and what that life means. That it's not that environment. So when we're called to do those things in this environment, we feel the pressure of that. You feel the world persecution when you say you're a Christian today because it's not popular to be a Christian. So what allows us to thrive even in that environment? Paul talks about five things that allow us to be 
uh, to thrive in that environment. And they come from verses 13 and 14 primarily. He says, but we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, beloved of the Lord, because God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Remember, this morning I'm talking about the strength you get because of salvation. The first thing you need to get strength from is the fact that you're loved by God. You are loved by God. And I don't care how many times you've just heard that and thought, well, yeah, that's true. I want you to really consider what that means. A holy All-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful God focuses all of that power on loving you. Anybody here knows what it means to be loved? Anybody here ever had a human relationship where you felt truly loved? If you've known what it's meant to be loved by somebody, to have somebody look at you as being the center of their universe, to have somebody sacrifice for you, Somebody make sure that they were there for you. They were about you, not just themselves. They weren't about what they could get from you. They were about what they could give to you. Have you ever had somebody who looked at you and were, they were always thinking about how to make you better, how to secure you, how to provide for you? If you've ever known that kind of love, then think about what God does when he loves you. To comfort the church at Thessalonica, Paul says to them, you are beloved. You are beloved. You may not feel all warm and tingly inside right now. You may be going through it, but I want you to know that God loves you. One of the evidences of God's love is that he tarries with us. He he has forestalled his coming while we get our acts together. He could have come before we acknowledged him. He could have come before we surrendered and submitted to him. But he waited. He waited for us. He's waiting on us. Why? Because he loves us. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. So he wants them to know. Your beloved, find strength in the idea that God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. How do I know that he loves me? He gave his son to die for me. That son gave his life for me. And then three days later, picked it back up again. So that through him, I could live also. If that doesn't excite you, then something's wrong with your salvation. Your salvation is broken. Because all you need to do is think about the love of God as demonstrated through Jesus Christ to excite you. No matter what else is happening in your life, know that God loves you. And if he doesn't do anything else, he's done the superior, the supreme thing that love can do. He sacrificed self for you. Beloved. But not only that, in verse 13, five things, he loves you. The second thing is he chose you. He chose you. He chose me. In the gospel, according to John, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he he says to them that, you know, I don't I don't call you servants. I call you friends. He he tells them, I've chosen you. I've chosen to be with you. I selected you. I didn't have to, but I did. God didn't have to choose us, but he did. Remember, the the, the human experience breaks down to the point where God chooses for himself a people so that he could speak to the world through them. But he didn't just segregate his love and and only give it to them. His, His love is poured out now to all of us, even us that are not Jews. God has chosen us too. And we weren't an afterthought. God always had us in mind. He has chosen us. Do you know how good it feels to be chosen? When I was a little boy and I'd be playing with my friends outside and we do the, you know, the tag football, pick up football games, basketball games. We know how we did it. Everybody get up against the wall. We have the two best players of captains. Anybody ever do that? Two best players of captains. And each captain get to choose people. Do you know what it felt like to be the, the last person? You may not know what it felt like to be the last person chosen, but Lord knows I know what it felt like. To be the last person chosen, especially for football, little scrawny dude. You can't do nothing with that, right? So I was a concession. The last person, the person with the last choice, they got me. They called me bow nail. Okay, we got bow nail. Have bow legs. That didn't feel good. It didn't feel good to have someone choose me because they felt like they had to. 
Because I was the, thank you, I was the only option left to them. Isn't it great to, great to be somebody's first choice? And for those of you who married the love of your life, it wasn't it great to be the first choice? Any, anybody ever just been content to be somebody's concession prize or the leftovers? Or, anybody ever been in a shotgun wedding? Raise your hand. I want to talk to you. Anybody? <laughs> first choice. God has made us his first choice. Get excited about that. Be strengthened by that. You are God's first choice. He never loses sight of you. He knows where you are all the time. He knows what you're going through all the time. And he's there to speak to you and through you all the time and comfort you even as you go through your stuff. Our struggles are not an excuse for us to disbelieve the presence of God, to think that somehow God has abandoned us because we're going through, because we know when we have faith, even in our trials, he's still giving us peace and joy and pouring out his love and showing us he's still there. If you open up your eyes and look for God, looking unto Jesus, the author, if you're looking for him, you'll see him even in your stuff. Even in your stuff. But you got to be looking for him. Only, only those who look for him will see him. He loves you. He chooses you. And then I love this third one in verse 14 when he talks about, he, he tells the church at Thessalonica, God called you. I'm thinking about Angela's phone calls. 2,500 miles away, right? God's way out there. You can't see him. How do I know he's thinking about me? God calls us. I don't want you to think about that as a, as a one event that happens in your life, one, one time in your, the history of your life. No, God, every day, God's calling you. Every day, as long as you don't have call block on his number. God's calling you, as long as you're not screening his phone calls. God's calling you. Every day, he's calling out to you. In some way, I, I tell the story all the time, right? I, super sensitive to, to God speaking. And I could be driving down a, a road and, and look up at, a, at a, a, a billboard and see God calling me, calling out to me, calling for me. I look at a sign that says, God milk. And I'll think, wow, the spirit will start moving in me. Borden, have you been desiring the sincere milk of the word? Don't get so complex and so deep that you don't appreciate the fundamentals. I got all that from the billboard that said, God milk. How did I get all that? Holy Spirit speaking in me, calling me out. Pay attention, son, calling me out. A little child can say something. They don't realize that they're speaking God into your life, but they can say something, a phrase. They can ask you a question. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit in you will perk up and start to minister to you. God's calling out to you. He's called you. There is a purpose for your existence. There is a design behind your being that gives you great value. And every day, the Holy Spirit is wanting to just ring out in your soul. God's calling you. He's calling. It's a fresh call every day. Number four of the five things. Number four of the five things. In verse 14, it also talks about them believing the gospel. Whereunto he called you by our gospel, by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The calling is according to the gospel. There is a message in scripture that is written for you. This book is a letter to you. It is perhaps the longest letter you've ever received in your life, but it is a letter to you. Just like it's a letter to me. It is making predictions and promises. It's laying out principles and discussing my purpose. And it's meant for me to consume and to believe. I believe God's word. How am I strengthened? By my faith in God's word. Another way of thinking about that, beloved, is that no matter what I feel about it, no matter what it seems like, I believe what God said, not always what I see. I believe what God said, not always what I see. 
because your eyes can fool you. Have you ever been driving down a long stretch of road on a warm day and the road looked like it was liquid? Man. Was the road liquid? No. Your eyes were fooling you. Have you ever put on something that looked like it was pink? Got out to the world, only realized you were wearing peach. Your eyes do fool you. I do not always believe what I see, but I do believe what God said about my life. He said, no weapon formed against me would prosper. I do declare there have been days where it looked like the stuff that was coming against me was going to overcome me. And I had to make a choice to believe God's word. No weapon formed would prosper. There have been days. When I had needs and I didn't see how that need was going to be met. But then I remember God's word. I shall supply all of your needs. There have been days when I felt like nobody really understood what I was going through. Nobody was really to walk with me where I had to walk. But then I remember God's word. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I'll always be with you, even to the end of the world. I'm strengthened when I choose to believe God's word. I do not always believe what I see, but I'll always believe what God said. And then finally, at the end of verse 14, he says, where he says, whereunto be, uh, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the end game here? What's the outcome of all this? Paul said, if I had hope only in this life, I would be of all men most miserable. But my hope is not only in this life. I do not judge my success by how much money I make. I do not judge my success by how many friends I have. I do not even judge my success on how my children turn out. <laughs> I judge my success based on the fact that I've done the will of my God and I have his promise that I will share in his glory. I am an heir. I am a joint heir with Christ. What is his is mine. What is mine is his. And I find strength in that. I find strength that I don't have hope only in the observable, only in the discernible. There is this great thing that God has prepared for me. In fact, the Bible says it has not even entered into my mind. I cannot conceive of what that glory is going to look like, that Shekinah glory, that great incomprehensible glory. But again, I do not believe only what I can see. But I also believe in what God said. And he told me he's prepared a place for me. He's prepared a place for me that where he is, I will be also. I can't wait. I cannot wait with these escalating real estate prices in Southern California. I cannot wait. And the house that he's prepared for me has no property taxes. They were paid on the cross. No maintenance costs. They were paid on the cost. Don't have to worry about furnishing it. It was all paid on the cross. He has made a place for me that where he is, I will be also. So I'll leave you with this thought. I know you look around you and death reigns all around you. It's, it, it's everywhere. People are dying in war. People are dying of famine. People are dying of disease. People are dying of crime. People are dying everywhere. They're slaying each other in the street. But believers, we have hope. How many of you know we have hope? And because we have hope in Jesus Christ, death can never be our final result. You want to talk about getting straight through salvation. The very idea of salvation is that those who live in Christ will never die. Uh, good God from Zion. I just want you, to, I want you to go home with that one today. Those who live in Christ will never die. And everything that God has ordained will never die. Death cannot be the final word when your life is hid in Christ. When I was a little boy, 
I'd watch these shows on TV that were serial shows, you know, like Batman and stuff like that with Adam West. And at the end of the show, they'd always leave you with a cliffhanger, and then the words would appear on screen, stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned. And I often think of that phrase when I'm going through my stuff, and I think that God has promised me things that I cannot even imagine, and I tell myself, stay tuned. God's up to something in my life. Stay tuned. This madness, this mess I'm going through ain't nothing but a cliff anger for something greater that is to come. Stay tuned. Our doubts cannot be the end of our story. Our fears cannot be the end of our story. Our uncertainties cannot be the end of our story. Because Christ himself has written our story. He is the author. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Better days are ahead. Because Jesus lives. Better days are ahead. I just want you to understand that. No matter how good your days were, sometimes we think, well, my best days are behind me. Come on, really? Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. And you're going to have an eternity of best days. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to have an eternity of best days. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of, gore, of glory? The Lord God, strong and mighty. Who is the king of, of glory? The Lord God, mighty in battle. Every head bow, every eye closed. Father, we thank you today. Thank you for victory in Jesus Christ. Thank you for victory in Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving our souls and giving us strength by the outpouring of your Holy Ghost, giving us strength to live for you, to live for you, to live eterni eternally with you. God, we, we are so inspired. We are so uh, energized. We are so strengthened. To live for you because of what we know you can do and will do. God, we give you all glory because you are worthy of our praise. If anyone's under the sound of my voice and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please come to know him today. Surrender and submit your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Be saved today. Repent of your sins. Acknowledge him as your savior. Be saved today. Is there one? Is there one? We have done as we've been commanded and yet there's room. You may take your seat. Amen. Everyone standing on the left side of me.